I'm Lam Fu, a professor in physics from the Australian National University. Today is the second uh, ICANX Talks of November, and it's also 169 ICANX Talks. And this is our speaker and panelist tonight. So at, at first, uh, let me introduce our speaker tonight, Professor Len Yang from Washington University uh, at St. Louis. Professor Lan Yang is the Edwin H. and Florence G. Skinner Professor in the Preston M. Green Department of Electrical and Systems Engineering at Washington University in St. Louis. She's also the Editor-in-Chief of Photonics Research. Professor Yang received um, her bachelor degree from the University of Science and Technology of China and completed her PhD in Applied Physics at Caltech in 2005. Her research interests have been interests have been focusing on the fundamental understanding of lab matter interactions and their applications. Professor Young has, um, um, has received an NSF um, career award in 2010 for her work on single nanoparticle detection and the sizing using an on-chip optical resonator. She also received the 2010 Presidential Early Career Award for scientists and engineers. She's a fellow of OSA, IEEE, APS, and the um, AAAS. And also she has been recognized as one of the highly cited researchers by Clarivate each year since 2019. Professor Yang shared her experience in the Mid-American Emmy Award-winning uh, winning short film in 2020 titled Changing the World Through Science, Lan Yang, and which captures her dedication, perseverance, and passion for science. So without further ado, it's a great pleasure to have you here tonight talking to us, um, Professor Yang, and the stage is now yours. You may Thanks share your screen. Yeah. yeah. Let me share my screen. Um, I think uh, I, need, I need to be enabled to share my screen. I, I think you can't share now. Uh, I can see. No, I should be able to. Can you see my okay. screen? Yes. Yes. It's all good. Yeah. Okay, it's my great honor to be here. Thanks uh, for the nice introduction by Professor Lan Fu. It's my great honor to share what we have done in the past few years and to share what I think about the field. And um, today, uh, as you can see from the title, I will talk about a very interesting platform. There are a lot of things we can explore uh, in photonics field, but we need to follow hard to find the one that we find the most exciting. And for me, optical resonator is really unique structures among all the kind of resonators. Uh, whispering gallery structure is uh, uh, is in the center of the of various kind of choices. And today I will review uh, the interesting, exciting application and the fundamental science that can be explored in these amazing structures. And also prepare my slides in such a uh, in such a way that even laymen can understand the significance of, of this line research. First of all, let's think about why we choose photonics. Right, this is a uh, um, this slide shows various kind of icons that symbolize different applications. You know, from microscope that allow us to see things beyond the reach of human uh, human eyes. And also, you know, um, uh, build a gigantic system that allow us to detect the weak uh, gravitational wave from universe. And also, uh, there are a lot of application of using light to see this microscopic interactions, such as molecule interactions and protein interactions. So there are a lot of things we can do. And uh, about using light. Uh, uh, light can be used for telecommunication. For example, when you use a single fiber, it can connect the light signal from one continent to another one. That's a straightforward way to use light. But here I want to use a different analogy, for example, in water, to tell you why uh, different structures can turn light in a different form. For example, uh, if you think about waters, even in ancient times, thousand years ago, people already used how to water, how to use water to convert um uh, to convert one form of energy to another one, right? Or well, currently, for example, um, by using um uh, this um by using water, we can generate uh, electricity, for example. And here, how about light? Uh, the light um. Oh, I have forgot to mention another thing. So, for water has been used for many years, right? However, um, it, ha it happens that when you 
heat up temperature, temperature of water. So it's still water. However, the only thing you change is temperature. So what is temperature? Temperature actually is related to vibration of atoms molecule uh, in the materials. Um, for, for example, when you heat up a materials, basically you increase the amplitude and frequency of vibration molecules and um, atoms. So you increase a collision among them and increase a collision between this atoms molecule uh, between, uh, with the container, for example. So if you have a way to increase this kind of, uh, this kind of activities, the different things will happen. For example, if you can find a way to increase light intensity, then there's several things will happen. For example, imagine laser that was invented um, almost uh, 70, uh, 60 years ago in 1960. Uh, when there is a strong light intensity, then you are able to excite the molecule and atoms in a ground level to higher level. Sometimes um, when there are so many uh, population um, excitation, to upper energy level, then we call it a phenomenon that is called a population inversion. Population inversion refers to such, such a phenomena. Uh, normally in, uh, in general state, atoms and ions, molecules, they, stay, uh, they tend to stay in ground level. However, when there is sufficient energy to excite them to upper energy level to create this population version, then this the um, uh, the phenomena uh, that is called a stimulated emission will happen. That phenomena will help you to generate coherent photon. And when there is sufficient amount of coherent photon, and when this happens in a structure called uh, resonators, then lasing will be generated. So that is a benefit of using a unique structure to convert light in different form to generate a new phenomenon. For example, here we use resonator to, to, um, to accumulate a sufficient amount of light energy in a confined volume. Then interesting thing will happen such as laser. And uh, in addition to laser, there are many other things such as enhanced light matter interaction for sensing application and also enhanced light, uh, light interaction will enable nonlinear effects. That is why we're interested in resonators. And for conventional design of resonators, um, it can be, um, it can appear in different form, uh, but this is a simple illustration to show how to generate and how to define our resonators. It's a, such a simple structure. For example, if you have some light reflecting elements uh, that allow you to confine light in a confined volume so that light is confined inside can and, and, and a bounce back and forth between the various uh, between those light uh, light reflecting elements, then they accumulate on each other. And especially when um, a certain condition is satisfied, such as, um, as uh, construct interference, then there will light accumulate on, each other, uh, on top of each other, and then light intensity will be enhanced. And uh, there is straightforward application, for example, like a sensing, if there is a nanoparticle um, or molecule protein uh, on the path of the light, you can see that those kind of interactions enhanced. This will allow you to see the signal from this even uh, tiny structure like a single molecules. But how to define and quantify the number of round trip that can be realized by light? Um, there's a par parameters. It's called a quality factor. Before I tell you the quality factor, uh, let's review um, the uh, whispering gallery mode. So uh, from previous slide, you can see as long as you can find a way to confine light, right? So there is a very interesting phenomenon that was originally found over a hundred years ago uh, by Lord Rayleigh. He found it in an acoustic regime. And this is a picture I, I, I copied from Wikipedia page. And this is a small area that is called Whispering Gallery uh, because a, a whisper, a sound wave, can propagate along the curved surface and be heard throughout the gallery spaces. That is why it's called whispering gallery structure. And for us, um, you probably, uh, wherever you go, um, which country, uh, you, you name it, uh, this phenomenon actually has been found in many different constru uh, constru uh, uh, architectures. So that tells us, you know, science is everywhere. It doesn't need to be invented in modern, uh, modern world. In many, many years ago, pe um, people already found it 
and I use such a phenomena to build some interesting art architecture. For example, in China, this is called the Huiyingbi in Tiantan. You can enjoy this phenomena. And for us, uh, working in the field of light field, uh, the we, there's no fundamental difference from sound wave and light wave, right? As long as you can find a way to form such a tiny structure with some optical transparent materials, the light wave can do the same as acoustic wave have done in those architectures. And here's a simple equation put it here. It's called resonant condition. It tells us when the round trip of this periphery is equal to the energy number of wavelengths, then after light finish a one round trip, the phase change is integer number of two pi. And with that condition, you're going to see constructive interference. If the light can circulate around for a millions of times, then there are millions of copies of those light and they will construct uh, constructively build up on each other and the light intensity will be enhanced. The beauty of whispering gallery structure is uh, it can appear in different form. It's not related, uh, limited to a single uh, geometry or shape. It can be a microsphere or micro ring on silicon chip, micro disc, micro toroid. And as a cell application, for example, micro sensing application, the liquid can run through this micro bubble, uh, which is formed in the middle of capillary structure. And the capillary has been commonly used in biology. So that is really convenient for various kind of application depending on you on your use. And for example, for um, integrated photon, integrated photonics, you can leverage those semiconductor foundry to make it hundreds of thousands of micro ring on a single chip. So that is um, convenience, the uh, uh, versatility of the whispering gallows structures. And then in addition to the form, and different materials actually has been used to, to make various kinds of structures. For example, microsphere, uh, micro, uh, micro bubble, and uh, micro toroid, micro disc, micro ring, and in different panels, it just lists uh, various kinds of materials that, hand, can, has been, that have been explored by scientists all around the world to make various kinds of geometry, and in which uh, the whispering gallery mode can be supported. Uh, so take home message for you is if you wanted to form a uh, whispering gallery uh, mode resonators, you just find a way to create a geometry with circular boundary uh, so that light can propagate along the curve of the surface. And so here comes a slide that tells you what is a quality factor. The quality factor is defined as the ratio of stored energy over energy loss per cycle. So in extreme case, if there's perfect materials and there's no loss at all, then Q factor go to infinity, right? And so that, that means the higher Q means lower loss. Lower loss indicate high Q. So in time domain, it's straightforward to write uh, the equation that uh, the Q factor is, straight, uh, is directly related to the lifetime. So in time domain, you can see this exponential decay of light field, right? You can measure the lifetime uh, uh, in such a way to see, uh, for example, see how light decay in time domain. And to get a time constant, you get a Q, Q factor. And there's another way to char characterize the color factor. If you apply Fourier transform to an equation in time domain, it will give you another equation. And that is spectrum in frequency domain. And here we come, we have equation. And this equation tells you, actually, this is a function and with a uh, with a line shape, a uh, Lorentz line shape, and that's exactly what we observed in the experiments. And from the equation, you can see the line width of this spectrum is directly related to the Q factor. And if you reorganize this equation, it tells you when you get a such a spectrum in frequency domain, all you need to do is measure the line width, and you are the control of the experiments, right? You know what the frequency is. Get the ratio that will tell you the quality factor. And that's why you character quality factor in, in experiments. And let's take a look at the benefit of ultra high Q and the micro scale resonators. So there is a parameter I put it here, it's called a cavity power buildup factor. Uh, it's defined as circulating power in the cavity versus the input power you put in the system. And you can see that it's directly related to the Q factor and inverse related to the size. That is why we wanted to have high Q and a micro scale resonator because it will boost the build-up factor. 
And let's see how amazing it is. For example, for a, uh, for a micro resonator with a Q factor of 10 to 8, that can be achieved commonly in experiments. The larger group um, in, uh, in in China, all around and, and other countries that has been um, has been exploring uh, this amazing structure. For example, uh, Chung Hua Dong's group in USTC and the Yunfeng Xiao's group in Peking University. They have published a lot of uh, very exciting work on this line research. And for such a tiny structure with parameters, uh, you can uh, generate various kind of and explore various kind of phenomena. This is just an a, a, um, example of application that have been explored by groups, uh, by researchers uh, around the world. And this, but there is not a, a, a final a final list. There are still many other things because of limited space. I can only list those applications. And today I wouldn't be able to cover all of those, but I will touch some of the applications. And here, as you can see here, um, we wanted to have a, a spend a, a couple of minutes to take a look at the history of whispering gallery structure and tell you um, nothing happened overnight. It takes years of effort from scientists to find out to further push forward the development of research. So let's take a look at the history of whispering gallery mode. Remember the first laser was invented in 1960s. And, and here come um, whispering gallery structures. And the phenomena is not straightforward. So there's a very interesting experiment by a group of scientists in Bell Lab. So initially they just uh, play with a, cal uh, a calcium fluoride microspheres. And they shine a light on the microsphere, hoping this is for the microsphere made it well behave like lens to focus light, right? However, they found something really different from what they thought. That is actually the edge, the periphery, is right in the center. And so they started to work on that, explore and try to understand what's going on. And in the paper, they found actually, this is kind of phenomena that is already explored by others. It's called a whispering gallery. And uh, in such a phenomena, in, because of this effect, the light can be confined along the periphery as I just revealed, right? And then by using this effect, they generate the first whispering gallery laser because the phenomena uh, enable you to confine light along, along the periphery, right? Enhance light intensity. That is a very critical uh, uh, factors to generate a laser. So they, they demonstrated the whispering gala laser in 1961. And afterwards, um, um, a few years, uh, a couple of years later, another, another scientist found a similar phenomenon. And that's also related with whispering gallery. And, and here is a two papers um, that's published by Ashkin, the Ashkin who got Nobel Prize. So his group tried to levitate a light, uh, a particle by using light uh, that is optic trapping, right? And they found something interesting. Uh, if you look at the, uh, the, the, the on, on the left, there's a panel showing, for example, levitation power that is needed to float a microsphere. They found when they tune the wavelengths of the light at a certain frequency, at a certain wavelengths, you need you just need a lower power to, to float a levitate a microsphere. And why is that? Later it's found actually is called this related to uh, this up resonance. So in 1981, they published a paper on using um, about observation of up resonance of dielectric sphere by light scattering. So there's another effect, another experiment demonstrating the presence of whispering gallery mode. And also Richard Chang in uh, Yale University also do a lot of work uh, exploring this uh, light trapping, uh, this resonance effect in whispering gallery uh, droplets. And uh, those are fun experiments, you know, scientific discovery, fin exciting phenomena, but only until um, 2000, when there is a way to effective couple light in and out of such a structure, because previously it's um, people are using free space light. That is not an effective way to couple light into, this, into these structures. So in, in 2000, that is almost tw 20 years ago, a group of scientists in, uh, in JPL and uh, um, Professor Vahala in Caltech, 
they have demonstrated a series of very nice work on using a uh, fiber taper to couple light into uh, such a structure. And Carrie has some very nice paper showing that more than 99% of light can be coupled into such a tiny structure by using optic fibers, fiber taper. And the fiber taper can be made, uh, can be made uh, in a straightforward way. You just use uh, some heating source like a, like a hydrogen flame or CO2 laser to heat a portion of a single fiber commonly used in fiber communication and taper it to, um, to make the waste down to a, uh, um, one micrometer, then there is a sufficient amount of evanescent field leaking out that can be used to couple to cu couple into these tiny structures. And ever since, ever since then, the field started uh, start to grow because there is finally the efficient way to make good use of such a structure. And a lot of application, um, for example, this slide shows various kinds of nonlinear effects from Raman scattering for mixing, rewind scattering, and harmonic generation. And it's worth uh, noting that uh, more than 10 years ago, um, uh, Tabao's Kippenberg's group has demonstrated a frequency, frequency cone generation. And uh, micro cone has become a large field these days in photonics field. It started from this free, uh, the four way mixing um, demonstrated in these tiny structures. And in addition to this nonlinear effects, another interesting scientific phenomena is uh, uh, radiation pressure. So the phenomenon of radi radiation pressure has been found over, over 300 years ago. Uh, Johannes Kepler found that the comet has tails opposing the sun. And why is that? Uh, they found it's because of pressure from uh, the light. Uh, from, from light. And so uh, there's a branch of science uh, in physics. It's called the cavity optomechanics. Um, it's understandable because, as I said, um, radiation pressure is directly related to how much pressure applied by light to an object, right? And the cavity has a superior capability to enhance light intensity. So naturally, there is, um, you, can imagine, you, you can understand this uh, cavity optomechanics uh, can be boosted by this, uh, by this interesting resonance effect in this time, in these structures. And there's a very nice review for those of you who wanted to know more about the cavity optomechanics. I would strongly recommend you to read, to read this uh, review article about this topic. And here I wanted to mention an experiment that it was uh, demonstrated by my group. Um, so uh, this is a nice video to show an interesting phenomena is called a soliton. So soliton is an interesting waves um, because it's a nonlinear effects. Uh, the uh, the uh, you can see um, the 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 uh, wave can be generated for its generated for example in waters, and soliton is such a wave that it can preserve its shape when it propagates. So you can see if we have a, a way to generate soliton, then this is such a wave packet that carry information without deformation when it propagates in the median. So here it comes. There is a way to generate a mechanical soliton. This is not light structures. So as I mentioned, there's the optomechanics, right? Optomechanic effect. So imagine there's a microtorid structure. It's like a think about a, a structure like a mushroom sitting on a, a silicon uh, on the wafer. And this mushroom have the micro disc supported by a pillar, right? And when light is circulated around this around this structure, it changes direction. And we know when an object changes direction, then it means the momentum is changed, right? When the momentum is changed, then there got to be some force applied to this, uh, to, to apply to it. And here is light photon. Where is light, where is force come from? The light only in, um, propagate in these structures. So it must come from the structure itself and it comes from the wall. And when it changes structures, and there is a force applied to light. And for, uh, according to Newton's law, there are two objects. When ob one object apply force to another one, then the, the, the other the another object also will apply the force back to the object, right? So that being said, if there is a force applied to light so that it changes momentum, changes direction, there got to be force applied by the light to the object. And that is what happened here. And the light circulated around, apply force to the object. 
here is resonators. So that they can see the vibration of this micro disc. You can see wobbling of the structures, right? And these structures actually is related to some kind of uh, phenomena. Is here we found actually when you try to observe light propagate through so such a structure in time domain, you can see actually a spike. And this spike is you can imagine that as a solid in time domain, right? And a single spike is a single spec uh, soliton generated. And it can, when uh, I don't have video shown here, um, but in a video we observed in experiments, we found this is, this is single pulse can preserve its shape in time domain. And we also know for a single pulse in time domain, if you convert in frequency domain, the narrow the time that pulse in time, the broader is spectral in frequency domain. And that is what we observed in frequency domain. You can see a, a spread spectrum. Um, and that is related to an application we can explore. For example, um, when there is a, 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 um, the, the many modes vibrating at, at the same time, and cover a broad spectrum. And we tried to use that for, for example, for sensing application. We approach this soliton, uh, the, the, this resonator, supporting a soliton inside the structure by, uh, with a vibration mode, a vibration object. When this tiny ob object vibrates, it generates a kind of vibration mode, right? And this vibration mode um, um, vibrate in a frequency at 100 kilohertz. And I try to uh, collect that, and we found um, it's hard if if it's operating in a conventional regime. For example, we have a resonator, right? Uh, it has in, its intrinsic mechanical mode, and uh, that is what we observed, and we saw it here. Um, this is uh, the in uh, in at inset. You show the intrinsic vibration spectrum of the resin itself. It has it support a mechanical mode vibrating at seventeen megahertz. However, if you, when we try to, to collect the response of these tiny vibrating tips, you see nothing. There's no signal signal collected by that by 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 the resonators. However, if you operate the resonator in soliton regime, in solar regime, in the frequency in in this in the spectrum, right? As I said, there are hundreds more of vibrating at the same time. Then let's take a look of the spectrum. That covers spectrum from the tiny uh, tiny tip, the vibrating at 380 kilohertz. Now you see the sig signal is collected by the soliton resonators. So that means when you have many things work at the same time, the collect effect allow you to see the collect very weak signal in the environment. So this is what we call the soliton enhanced sensing. That's just one application that can be explored by this phenomenon. So there's still many things that can be explored, um, but because of limited time, I want us to uh, focus on other two things. Uh, let's switch our gear and focus on one exciting application that is sensing. And this is a review paper um, uh, that uh, talk about various kinds of sensing. And uh, uh, with limited time, I would just focus on fundamentals that enable those various kinds of sensing applications. So in uh, resonators, as I have mentioned in the previous slide, in, uh, uh, in a conventional spectrum, you see a, a Lorentz line shape that indicate a certain frequency. Light is trapped inside, right? When we use it for sensing, you will be able to see various kinds of changes depending on the nature of the sensing targets. So for example, when the targets um, uh, for example, such as molecule has very different refract index from surrounding medium, change refract index change. Then what you're gonna see is resonance shift. It's called the mode shift. Um, that is changes that we observe in the sensing experiments. However, in a different scenario, if the sensing targets has similar refract index from surrounding medium, but has strong absorption, then what you will see is line width broadening. Because we know the line width is related to photon lifetime, right? So when there is a strong materials, strong loss introduced by sensing targets, it will adjust the photon lifetime. Then according, uh, then subsequently, then you will see a line width change. That is what we call the mode broadening. And there is yet another phenomenon. In some scenario, 
you will see single resonance split into two. And that occurs when there is strong light scattering introduced by the structure, for example, nanoparticle, then single resonance will split into two. So basically, um, based on changes appear in the spectrum, you will be able to do not only sensing, but also tell the nature of the targets. So um, this topic, this application has been explored by many groups. And I specifically want to mention Frank Volmer, uh, uh, Steve Arnold's group. They, uh, they are the truly uh, pioneers in the field. Over 20 years ago, they used a tiny microsphere and put in a, in a solution and demonstrate, you know, molecule bindings and protein bindings can be indicated and detected by these simple microsphere structures. And later, uh, Frank also demonstrated that uh, um, uh, in addition to microsphere, if you can add the plasmonic structure into mode volume, then the two folds of enhancement, plasmonic enhancement, and also um, whispering gallery enhancement, so that this two-fold enhancement will allow you to see even smaller targets, such as single ions. So he also did a lot of very exciting research uh, in this direction. And uh, in, in this talk, I will talk about a different phenomena that is most splitting. So imagine a perfect sphere um, coupled with a waveguide, where it light is coupled from left to right, so you can excite whispering gallo mode in clockwise direction. So on the right, you can see a spectrum indicating a single resonance. When there is a nanoparticle, introduce light scattering so that light is getting to opposite direction. Then those two, uh, this light propagating kind of uh, in opposite direction, they can interact with each other. Such interaction will lift the degeneracy so that Single resonance is split into two. And interesting, actually, we can quantify the most of the spectrum. For example, here, if we use 2G to characterize separation of the of the of the of the frequency, and it's related to uh, the, uh, some parameters. The alpha here is the polarizability of, of the structure. And if you're dealing with spherical particle, it will tell you that polarizability is directly related to the size. And what is F? Uh, oh, by the way, this is gamma is related to, uh, is, it can be characterized, uh, quantified by um, uh, the language difference. You can measure this gamma, uh, gamma directly uh, from the spectrum. So both parameters can be measured directly uh, from the most valid spectrum. And they are related to the polarizability and the F. And F, what is F? F is overlap of the targets and the light field. And that's um that can be uh, that, that can be understood, right? Because when there is no overlap at all, of course, there won't be any, any change. F will be equal to zero and 2G and it will be equal to zero. And, uh, and and V here is mode volume. And in reality, you wouldn't be able to uh, characterize uh, each of those separately. But if you take a look at the ratio between these two parameters, then you will find a very simple formula. That is, this uh, the ratio of this line width, um, uh, the line width difference and the, the frequency separation is only determined by polarizability. So that being said, if you get the most splitting spectrum, um, get the parameters, you get a number. That number is directly related to the polarizability. And if you're dealing with a spherical structure, that will tell you the size. And that is how we did the first experiments. Uh, we did uh, we deposit particle one by one on the ring of the microsphere, microtoroid, and you get the parameters. And that gives you the size information directly. And we did measurement, um, but it's just claiming you have measurement is not enough. You need to have a standard approach to calibrate your measurement. And here in our case, you will use a scanning electron microscope to measure the particle and measure um, and, and found that the measurement is consistent with our, with our measurement. So with that, we are confident to say that uh, whispering gallery mode uh, resonators can be used for not only detection, but also single uh, size measure, measurement of single nanoparticle. 
And this is movie actually showing that when we deposit particle one on the structures, we can see discrete changes on the spectrum. And uh, for every single most split most spectrum, we have formula to characterize size information. And uh, so for now, I already talked about how to use the signal from the single mode for the sensing, right? But actually it's more than that. Here we demonstrate yet another, uh, another line research to make uh, more information shown in a spectrum. So in reality, in reality, the many mode in a spectrum, right? And so we think, why don't we use the collect information of the whole spectrum instead of using a single resonance? So that is why we uh, developed this, what we call the barcode. So what is barcode? Take a look at the barcode. Uh, every single bar indicate one resonance. So the depth of the resonance is indicated by the color and the line width is indicated by the width. And the position of this resonance indicated by the location of the, of the line in the bars. So in this case, we don't care about, you know, following, tracking a single resonance, uh, because sometimes that's difficult, right? Um, when you do a sensing experiments, for example, temperature sensing, when the temperature variation is, too, is big, the single resonance will move out of the scanning range of the spectrum, and you then need to have the tune the spect uh, the scanning uh, range of, the, of 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 your measurement. So that's a little bit challenging for some application. When you use a barcode, actually you don't care about the very uh, specific mode. You only care about the patterns, the collective uh, over uh, collective behavior of the whole spectrum. You only care about the relative position of the line with an, with with another with another one. You only care about the width of the mode. So with that, we do a very fun experiments uh, that is temperature sensing. Uh, previously, if you look at, if you use resonance shift, it only tell you the relative change, the, how much temperature, how much changes in the temperature. It wouldn't tell you the, the actual temperature, right? However, when you use barcode, you will be able to do that, tell you exactly what the temperature is, because we found when you have a specific resonators, a specific temperature, the spectrum will look differently. So for every single temperature, you can get a unique bar, uh, barcodes and you can do a calibration. So you can have a database. In a database, you have thousands of spectrum and um, so, uh, corresponding to each uh, different unique temperatures. So we did such a measurement and found, yes, we can do one-to-one -one mapping for temperature measurement. And why is interesting? Because there are a lot of, already a lot of thermometers existing, right? But as I said, the beauty of micro resonators is sensitivity and in micro scale measurement. So we did fun experiments. We want to measure the evaporation of this tiny droplet, micro, uh, for example, several microliters. And we put different droplets and uh, uh, from, uh, for different chemi chem with different, chemis different chemicals. And we found because the chemicals are different, right? So that evaporation will happen differently. And we found actually uh, the, the dynamic behavior of evapor evaporation corresponding to different droplets are very different. So we get the signatures of those uh, evaporation for different droplets. And this is just the one experiment on demonstrating uh, the application of such a, a micro scale uh, thermometers. But the application is beyond that. This is just uh, one, uh, I would say, um, tip of iceberg. And there are many things we can explore. And uh, uh, light, uh, the Light Journal actually made a very nice uh, rendering to show um, showcase the application and of, uh, of such a structure. It's like a barcode that can be used for various kinds of application. And I also want to emphasize the Sparkle technology is not limited to uh, resonators. For any structures, photonic structures, with spectrum, a complicated spectrum, you can form such a barcode for various kinds of applications. And uh, with that, I wanted to change our, uh, a topic a little bit. So again, but let's start from the history of, of, uh, of sensing. So as I said, 
Initial, we use resin for particle sensing, right? So particle get light, and you see the changes in most splitting spectrum. So more than 10 years ago, we published this work. Uh, this work is about uh, using some nanotip to mimic nanoparticle, so we can have a systematic investigation to see how most splitting spectrum changes when light scattering changes. So it's all about sensing. But we do include one a single a line in these papers. We say in some uh, in some in in some condition, we see a phenomenon that is related to exception points. And so, what is that? So, what exception point? So, this is a demonstration showing how we did experiments, right? And we found that when we use two nanotip to mimic a nano, nano scatterer, when the tip move around. The, the, uh, around the ring, you did see the changes in most split, most splitting spectrum. But a certain condition we found, this actually two split modes, they converge, converge to a single resonance. And what is that? Um, we didn't look into it, but we found, found literature, they said that this phenomenon might be related to exception points. What exception point? Exception point is a special state of any open system that when you control the parameter of your system, you can push the system in such a scenario that all the eigenstates coalesce at, at one. When there's only one eigenstate, then you only have one eigenvalue, right? So that is uh, that is phenomena that we found many years ago, but we didn't put too much attention about it until um, 10 years ago. And that is 2013. We found a very interesting phenomenon. It's called a peritone symmetry. And we started to explore that, then look into what is called exception points. So even for, and uh, just for this resonant platform, we found the various kind of way to tune the system around the exception point. Because as I said, in an open system, there must normally, there are multiple parameters you can play with the system, right? For example, in whispering gallery structure, the structures, there's some, uh, let's look at the left panels. Those are two coupled ring indicated by different colors. We use different colors to indicate the loss and the gain in such a structures, right? Here, by attuning the coupling and loss gain contrast, we can operate, operate the system at exception point these are the uh, other spectrum. There are the curves showing, you know, uh, changes of the of, of the eigenvalue. And at the, uh, at a certain point, ended by the arrows here, that is point when the um when when uh, exception exception point is uh, is is realized. And in the in the middle panels, is different uh, way to tune the system at exception point. Here we approach one of the resonator with a uh, with a chromium tip. Chromium has strong absorption at one point five micrometer, uh, one one point five micro micron, and we, we use uh, the light um, at one point five micron. That is wavelengths commonly used in, in in telecommunication. When you when you approach the uh, the resonator with uh, with a chromium tip then there is strong absorption uh, induced by the chromium tip, right? So by tuning just loss in the structure, we can also push the system to exception point. In the last scenario, here we just use two nanotip to adjust light scattering in such a structure. We also can push the system at exception point. So think about your, your own system. Any system, electronic system, mechanical system, if you can appropriately adjust your parameters, you will be able to push your system at a certain point. And here I want to pick a special system in uh, um, that is called a parity time symmetry. So what is time parity time symmetry? Um, so it occurs in the context um, of quantum mechanics. So in um, in that context, we started to explore an uh, ideal, uh, ideal system. In an ideal system, it's a closed system without energy exchange between the, uh, with the surrounding medium or the environment, right? In such a system, if you look at this closed system characterized uh, um, 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 Hamish, um, Hamiltonian, we call that Hamiltonian Hamiltonian. And if you solve the math, trying to understand how the system evolved, it will tell you the system is characterized 
um, by this operators, it will give you, uh, it will tell you the eigenstate and the eigenvalue, and the eigenvalue characterize how the system behave. The eigenvalue will be a real numbers. Uh, however, in reality, we are not dealing with a closed system. We always deal with an open system. And the open system is, uh, is understood and studied by non-Hamitian Hamiltonian. And for non-Hamitian Hamiltonian, it always gives you the complex eigenvalue to characterize the system. And then you may wonder, is there something in between? An open system, for example, characterized by non-Hamitian Hamiltonian. However, if you solve the math, whether we can set the condition in such a way that will get, that will give you real, real eigenvalue. And turns out, yes, actually, the, there is a, such a condition. That is what we call a uh, PT symmetric system. And it was proposed in 1998 by Carbender and his colleague. It tells you that if you have a way to de develop a PT symmetric system, it's a, such an open system that have balanced the loss and the gain then you will be able to achieve PT symmetric system that will that behave like a closed system. And let's take a look at what is PT system. This is intuitive way to understand that. So what is P? P is a parity operators. Uh, in a, another way to understand that is um, uh, reflection transformation. So if you have a system including two units, all you need to do is under this uh, parity operation, and then it switches position. Um, in a, and what is time operation? Time operation is just reverse the time, right? So if you have a system including two subunits, one have loss, one have gain. So what is gain? Gain means as time goes by, you uh, the energy increase, right? If there's a loss, as time goes by, you lose energy. And so that being said, on the time operator, on the time transformation, the loss become gain, gain become loss. So you have, if you have system, including two subsystems, the one have loss, one have gain. And on the P transformation, the switches position is different from the original state, right? However, if you continue working on it with the time operators, then loss become gain, begin become loss. It become the same as its original state. And that being said, such a system is neither P symmetric nor time symmetric, but it is PT symmetric. And for those of you who are interested in to know more about theory, I would suggest you to read the paper originally published in PIL. And for uh, and for me, I think epistemic symmetry is important, is interesting because it reminds us to use optic gain in a different way. Previously, we used like uh, gain to generate uh, uh, gain to generate um, uh, coherent photon, so we can make amplifier and lasers, those are really interesting functional components, right? Used uh, in various kind of application. But now we want to use gain in a different way. The gain is used to compensate loss uh, so that it can become some basic building block. If you form them differently, it will form different geometry and different structures and to generate various kinds of features and functions. So basically pro provide a way to um, approach or strategies to develop novel a uh, novel photonic system and uh, that it can achieve new functionalities. So that is how we think about the PT symmetry. That is why this is so interesting. And the PT symmetry, as I said, uh, is not limited to any physical system. It has been demonstrated in various kinds of uh, uh, physical system from mechanical system, the electronic system now has been heavily explored in photonic structures. And let's take a look and use the resonator as platform to understand the PT symmetry. When you have two couple of systems, and you try to and you uh, try to find out how the supermodes are formed, and uh, here's formula to tell you uh, the eigenfrequency of supermodes formed by those coupled structures, and the gamma one and the gamma two is in terms of the loss related to each individual resonators is nothing to do uh, with waveguide, and the gamma c here is the coupling loss. You know, um, between um, the uh, the one of the resonator with waveguide, and the kappa here is um, uh, is the coupling between the two resonators. Now you can see how those parameters behave and affect the frequency of the eigenfrequency. For example, 
take a look of those parameters in the square root operators. Depending on the amplitude, this number can be a positive or negative. The, if those uh, numbers are positive, right? The square root is just give a number, a real number. If this number are negative, then you can see this this square root give you a measure num uh, uh, um, imaginary number, right? And that will tell you how the eigen frequency uh, the eigen frequency is affected, whether it's affected in real part or imaginary part. Okay, and uh, why is and how to understand it in reality? Okay, here is um an interesting structures, including uh, PT symmetric pair, the red one, including uh, indicate one with gain. Um, and when they're coupled to each other, I show on the right, I show two panels, right? The blue curve show the curve, the results from PT symmetric pair. The red one are the results from uh, conventional pairs. And they look differently if you look at the, uh, the, the shaded area in yellow. And how to understand? I keep saying, hey, uh, the frequency, eigenfrequency, and the imaginary and real parts of eigenfrequency. What is that indicate in the in reality? So take a look at this formula here. E to the I omega t is used to characterize electromagnetic wave at the frequency omega, right? If the frequency here is eigenfrequency, the eigenfrequency have two parts real and imaginary parts. If you decompose the omega in real and imaginary parts, it will tell you something really interesting. The real parts is still, you know, it's still e to the i omega t, right? It's still related to, as you can see, related to the resonant frequency of the of the wave, right? However, for the imaginary part that has i in front of it, there's another i here. So the multiple one i with another i will turn that into a real number minus one, right? So actually, it tells you the imaginary part of the eigen frequency of, of resonant frequency, which is also the eigen frequency of resonant mode, is related to a real numbers here, and depending on the sign of the imaginary part of the eigen frequency, it will tell you whether the light will increase or decay as time goes by, right? So that is how um, how interesting it is to see the imagined part of eigenvalue influence the light field. So let's take a look at, uh, of this system again. When the two resonate coupled to each other, right, the supermodes will be formed. Here in this case, two supermodes are formed. And I have two panels. The left one show the changes of the real part of the eigenvalue when um how it changes when we change the coupling between the two resonators. And the right panels shows how the imaginary part of the eigenfrequency and, and changes when we change the coupling strength. And if you take a look of this PT symmetric pairs, you found actually let's take a look as uh, this is we, we call this is a PT broken regime. In this in this regime actually um it's uh Weak coupling because the coupling when the weak coupling is really strong, uh, we really small, uh, symmetry is broken, and uh, there's some abnormal behavior. That is, the in the if you look at the real part of the of the, of the supermodes, the real part is related to the frequency, right? It tells you even if when they couple to each other, the mode, the frequency are still the same. It's different from conventional pair. For conventional pair, when the two resonators are coupled to each other, the the two modes super mode form immediately, and they have different mode, different frequency that are indicated by two bifurcated lines, right? You saw it immediately. However, for the PT PT pairs, it's different. You 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 do have two super modes. However, the frequency are identical. It, however, if you look at the imagined parts of the frequency, they are different. And we also know the imaginary part of the frequency indicate loss and different loss and gain, right? It tells you in those PT broken regime, you do have two, two super modes. However, they experience different loss and gain. That's a little bit uh, um, counter in intuition because um, when you imagine super modes, they are coupled, they, they, they should propagate in two modes, in two resonators, right? They should experience the same loss and gain. How could this happen that two super modes, they experience different loss and gain? Before we look at the difference, we also notice there is a exception points. 
that is the point at which, you know, uh, if you look at different regime, uh, in the broken regime, uh, the imagined part are different. In the PT symmetry regime, the uh, the the imagined part is the same. However, the real part are different, right? So uh, they are all different in a certain regime. Uh, however, there are special point at which both imaginary and real part of eigenvalue coalesce. That is what called phase transition point for PT PT system or exception point of physical system. And before we look into the exception point, let's take a look at uh, the system as a whole. For example, if you think about this, uh, this as one unit and uh, look at operating system in a, P in a P PT broken regime, you found some uh, non-reciprocal behavior. So when light propagates in one direction, you see nothing. And then when light propagates in the opposite direction, you see enhanced light signal. And why is that? Why is that related to unbalanced loss experience, experienced by different supermodes? It turns out there's a mode of localization enabled by this phenomena. So when the system is operating in the broken regime, the two supermodes actually they they uh, they local they are localized in different resonators. One is localized in the one in with the gain, and one is localized and compromised, sacrificed in the lossy lossy structures. And because of localization and localization enhanced light intensity. And when light intensity is enhanced, nonlinearity will be enhanced. And nonlinearity actually is the reason for the non reciprocity. So, PD symmetry is not the reason for this non reciprocity. However, the PD symmetry phenomena enable those enhanced localization and which enhance uh, the light intensity, triggering this non reciprocal light transmission in such a structure. And that's how we understand this in this, in this regime. Initially for weak coupling, how come they have two supermodes with the same eigenfrequency but different loss? That is because the localization. That is why we observe that in the PT symmetry system. And in addition to you know this phenomena, and as I said, the I want to showcase resonator as a versatile platform. So let's see how non-hermitian physics, this exception point, converge with the sensing. So into um, nine years ago, uh, Jan Wiesig, um published a paper, theoretic paper in PIL in, uh, predicting that if we can operate a resonance sensor at a certain point, the sens sensitivity will be enhanced. And let's take a look at how it works. We already show, already explained, right? For this uh, whispering gallery structure, most splitting can be used to indicate nanoparticles. And now let's operate the system at exception point. And so there are two scenario. We compare the two scenario. And one is a conventional, a conventional sensor. And one is a sensor operating at exception point. They look the same. In, before we do the sensing experiments, for both of them, the single resonance, right? However, fundamentally, we need to keep that in mind. The physics are different. In conventional pairs, the two modes can be allowed. The light can propagate in either clockwise direction or counterclockwise direction. However, if you operate the system at exception point, remember at exception point, there's only one eigenstates that can exist. That means the light can propagate either in clockwise direction or counterclockwise direction. Only one mode is, is allowed. So fundamentally they're different. Then it turns out, yes, they behave differently. The amount of splitting observed in the exception point of sensor are much larger, larger than the one operating, you know, the conventional sensors. And uh, then we look into this and I found something really interesting. For conventional resonator sensors, the amount of splitting scales linearly with the perturbation strength. However, for exception point of sensor, the amount of splitting scales as square root of the perturbation strength, that is exceptional useful for weak signal because you think about number that's smaller than one, right? For example, 10 to minus six, it is so small, for example, in reality, in convention conventional sensor, the splitting is so small, we are not able to see it, right? Because the amount of splitting is too small. However, if you operate the system at a certain point, the amount of splitting you will observe will be square root of 10 to minus six, that will give you 10 to minus three, three order magnitude enhancement that will allow you to see the large change. 
that is beauty of exception point of sensors. And uh, we're also very happy. The work was published um, five years ago. And really, we are very happy because we found it's not this phenomenon had been demonstrated and adopted by many other groups in various kinds of systems, which is, so that being said, uh, we use the whispering gallery structure as a platform to explore the physics, demonstrate the concept. However, the phenomena is not limited to this, this specific structure itself. The resonator just gives you a superior capability to enhance the phenomena. So you can have a very nice result and to convince others, hey, here come a new approach to do sensing experiments. So this has been adopted by others. And uh, so recently we wanted to further explore um, uh, broadening its application. Because for example, in my original, in our original test, right? We need to operate, carefully adjust the system at an exception point and then run sensing experiments. But in reality, for example, a fiber sensor, fiber gradient sensor has been widely used, a commercialized, commercialized uh, for sensing application. May not be, you may not have freedom to adjust its parameter to operate its uh, the structure at a certain point, and that is why we um we develop this uh, uh, new approaches. We separate uh, the the system and separate a control unit that is operate at the exception point, and we have a remote sensor which can be any any form of optic sensors. So for the optic sensors that is sensitive to phase change, and those um uh, this work in such a way. Remember, I said. Uh, in a single resonator, I can operate the system at a certain point, right? By using two nanoscatterers, by operating uh, structures, the position of nanoscatterers. And here we adopt that concept. So here we have a control unit that is with spring structure, which can be packaged nicely, protected. And in this structure, we have one scatterers, uh, and then and to uh, one scatterers, right? And as we demonstrated previously in science, we say, hey, we need a nanoscatter to tune the system at an exception point. And here uh, we creatively use another sensor to, to, to behave as another scatter. So truly depending on the situation of the, of the remote sensor that behave as remote scatterers, it will affect the exception point of condition of the structure. So in, uh, in experiments, we observe the transmission of this EP, uh, of EP unit, but it carry information that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that, 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 that carry information the given by the sensors. So indirectly, we can understand the situation, the signal collected by the remote sensors. By doing this, we expand the EP's enhanced sensing to any kind of optic sensors. And so this is just, uh, we don't have time to show everything, but I will, will tell you, you know, this line research has spent over 10 years, it started from the PT symmetry, and then we explore other kind of applications, EP enhanced sensing and EP enabled a phonon, 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 phonon uh, along with growling, a phonon lasing and direction lasing, all those are enabled by this non-emission physics. So in summary, I would say um, PT symmetry and exception point, original study whispering gallery structures, but those just platform to explore physics and the phenomena and the finding are way more than what we demonstrated here today. And this is my last slide to tell you, um, um, uh, truly there are a lot of application that can be explored, uh, various kinds of ge geometry, right? Specifically, I wanna emphasize the recent development, development of integrated photonics. It will give us more flexibility, capability to control the resonance structures. And I also want to actually champion, uh, champion a review article written by Yunfeng and others. Very nice review, cover uh, various kind of um, a physical um, a platform uh, materials that can enable new phenomena in structures, leveraging the integral photonic circuits. Okay, so um, time is up. I just want to tell you this just, um, you know, we have been in the field for over 20 years and nothing, uh, it's impossible to cover everything in one hour talk. So there are many things that can be enabled by this amazing structures. I hope this talk can excite your interest to explore the science in whispering in resonators and whispering gallery structures. 
and uh, one more minute to talk about um, my um, my responsibility um, as editor in chief of Town Research. So this is a partner journal uh, sponsored by uh, for, uh, Chinese Laser Press and Optica Publishing Group. Um, with the uh, as a partner journal, with we, uh, we have advantages to leverage uh, the social media, uh, both pla uh, both platform, and for others. Uh, if you publish in Photon Research, we have various platforms to showcase and publish your research. And every year, we also have feature issues to talk about emerging topic um, uh, that interests the community. And this year, we have this topic about next generation silicon photonics and also uh, another feature of the issue about MetaSurface and its applications. And every year, we also se select a two Editor-in-Chief Choice Award, award and, um, and every, uh, the recipient will get 10,000 uh, 10, renminbi. The money doesn't reflect the value of the work, but it's a way to sh for us to appreciate the contribution from our authors. So in end, I wanted to thank uh, thank you for being with me uh, for the, uh, 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 this morning and and uh, tonight, uh, uh, and um, and uh, I, I I wanted to uh, tell you uh, the many things we can explore. And for those of you who want to know more about the working, visit our website. And thanks for your patience. Um, and let's please stay healthy and safe. Now I'm willing to take questions. Thank you very much, Professor Yang, for a really exciting talk. Not only covered the, you know, really great tutorial about the field of resonators, as well as you know many exciting work from your group. So now, uh, before we um go into the questions, let me first lay um introduce our panelists tonight. Okay. So our first panelist um, is Dr. Chi Tao Cao from um, the School of Physics at Peking University. Um, Dr. Cao received a bachelor degree and a PhD degree in physics from University of Science and Technology of China, and also Peking University in 2015 and 2020, respectively. His research interest is uh, um, on microcavity photonics and nonlinear optics. So far, he has authored or co-authored more than 25 peer-reviewed journal articles, including Nature Photonics, Nature Communications, PRL pens, with over 1,000 citations. He was awarded the Wang Daheng Optics Prize in 2020, and then the Rao Yu um, Tai Prize in Fundamental Optics in 2022. We have actually a few X challengers tonight. So the first X challenger is Xiao Xiong from Peking University. She received her PhD in physics from again USTC in 2017. And then after graduation, she worked in A star in Singapore for five years. In 2022, she joined Department of Physics at Peking University as associate researcher. She has won the Carlsberg Foundation Scholarship young and a Young Individual Research Grant. Her research interest is nanophotonics, quantum plasmonics, and non-linear -near -near optics in photonic integrated circuit. Our next challenger is um, Zhi Yan Wang. She is a PhD student in the research group of Professor Yu Feng Xiao. Um, at the School of Physics Peking University. She receives her bachelor degree in physics from Nankai University in 2021. And now she's working on nonlinear optics um, in micro resonators. Our next um, X challenger is uh, Chen Zhonghuang from Tsinghua University. Again, he's a PhD student in the Institute of Optoelectronic Engineering Department of Precision Instrument at Tsinghua under the supervision of Professor Liang Sai Chao. He received his bachelor degree from South China Normal University in 2019. And then in 2022 to 23, he become, became a visiting student in Italian uh, National U U Research Council. His research interest is in the field of computational imaging, focusing on high throughput label-free holographic imaging. So now let me welcome our panelists on the stage. Okay, so um, let's start with our X challenger. Whoever wants to ask the first question, please go ahead. 
Um, Hello? maybe I can go first. Oh, oh yes, please go ahead. Yes, that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, hi, no, Professor. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the stimulating talk. Uh, it's been really joyful to follow your lecture, like starting from the phenomena for layman. Um, I have the research background of plasmonics. Uh, plasmonic nanoresonators, they are quite similar to uh, microresonators, but have quite different or uh, opposite features in terms of the uh, more volume and the quality factor. Uh, currently, uh, I'm interested in combining these two types of cavities and leverage on the advantages of each platform. Uh, in particular, for sensing, uh, plasmonic sensing has been developed uh, very mature. Uh, probably the, I guess the, uh, well, uh, I would say it's the best developed field for plasmonics, probably. I think we lost the shell. Yeah, did we just lost her? Yeah, she's frozen now. Um, I guess the the most splitting type uh, optical sensing uh, versus the mode shifting types. Uh, is it like one wins another, or it depends on the the certain scenarios? Uh, then I have another. Uh, the the second question is that is there any chance that we can uh, make use of plasmonic nanostructures to uh, correct a system? Uh, with expert, uh, exceptional points. I guess the loss uh, induced by a plasmonic particle would be so huge compared to that induced by non-tips used uh, in your experiments. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so uh, we, we lost this uh, part of you. Uh, so so oh. I think you're frozen for, for several seconds, right? I tried to answer the question I, I just heard uh, and reminded me if I didn't answer some of your questions. Um, you asked a very good question, several. And one is, um, I we have been working on Whispering Gallery Resonator, right? But I didn't show today, actually, is a recent paper we just published this year with Light to integrate uh, Whispering Gallery mode with plasmonic structure. And I, I completely agree with you. I think plasmonic uh, structure is one of the most exciting topics that, is, as, as that has been explored in the past 20 years and it's still finished mm -hmm. yet because there are so many, uh, um, um, uh, so many structures you can make. The, the reason I like plasmonic uh, science is it's not, it's not limited to one structure. It can be bow tie structure, it can be nano rod and nanoparticle, yeah. right? You you, yeah. you you just name it. So researchers can design different plasmonic structure depending on the need. So what we did is uh, we integrate um we integrate uh, some um plasmonic structure on the substrate, and we use a microsphere to scan across the surface. So that you know in the bottom there are two layer of resonance in the bottom plasmonic resonance to generate a highly confined light field, right? And we collected the plasmonic field. From by using Whispering Gallery mode, so by doing this, you can further enhance the sensitivity of, of of a system. And the, um, so I do think that a lot of things we can explore with the plasmonic structure. Mm -hmm. And you asked also a very nice question. I was asked many times when I talk about the PD symmetry and the exception point. You know why? Yeah. One example I, I gave is loss engineering. I said, hey, in a structure, you just uh, adjust loss, right? We should consider as a negative things in the system. And but we can make use of loss to generate something interesting. And the plasmonic structure is very nice, enhanced light intensity, but there's an the issue that it's too lossy because yeah. you need metal and the metal is very lossy. So is that possible to do what you just said? The answer is yes. For any open system, if you adjust the, the parameters in your scenario, depending on, for example, plasmonic structure, right? You can change the coupling coupling between those uh, structures and uh, cut, uh, also uh, change the amount of mode um, between the metal layer and the dielectric structures. And by tuning, depending on your structure you're, you're talking about, by changing those parameters, you should be able to find a, a sweet spot so that the system is at ex exception point. And I want to emphasize another thing is exception point um, can separate the physical system in different regime. And in one regime, it is possible. The mode, you know, you have, you start to form some hybrid mode, right? In some regime, yeah. you can you can create those hyper mode, hybrid mode so that you can compromise, sacrifice some of the, uh, the, the hybrid mode and uh, save the other super mode. And both modes are still plasmonic mode. 
However, by tuning the loss tuning the parameters to country and, uh, and through the observation of exception point, you can push your plasmonic system in the regime that it can create a new kind of hybrid, hybrid mode, have less loss. It's enjoy still enjoy the benefit of plasmonic mode, but with a much much better feature, for example, longer photon lifetime to do the application you wanted to explore. Okay, thank you. Got, got it. <laughs> thank you. Yuken John, do you you have next question? Oh, please. Um, Professor Yang, and um, thank you for your very excellent presentations. So I have two questions. Yeah. And the first one is the uh, what is the minimal size of the optical resonance with the bi spring gallery mode, and what are the challenges of the fabricate it with the nano scale? What is uh, what is second question? Uh, this is the first question, and what are the challenges to fabricate the device with a nano scale? Oh, okay. Um, so that's also a very good question. Um. Mm. So the size and um, depend so uh, on the whispering gas structure, the basic requirement is you need to use a material that has higher refract index than the surrounding median. The larger refract index contrast you have, the smaller size you can push forward. Because oh. um, when you when when you shrink the size to too small, there will be a lot of radiation loss leaking to the surrounding median. So if you shrink the size, if you can have Imagine an ideal case. You can have, uh, if you have unlimited control of, uh, you, uh, you know, um, um, it's no, if there's no constraint for you to adjust in this contrast, you can push this size to sub micrometers. That can be done. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and, and as for the fabrication, oh, okay. yeah, oh. as for the fabrication, right? Uh, that's another beauty of whispering gallery structure. For example, if you don't have expensive equipment, if your lab doesn't have access to expensive equipment, you can still do whispering mm. gallery science. That is, you can have a single fiber, it's just glass fiber, right? And it's just pull it, whatever you some simple translation stage or even pull by hand to turn that side to really small, right? And then yeah. you form a fiber tip, then you can heat the tip with some heating source, such as hydrogen, hydrogen flame, and surface tension will make help you to make a microsphere. So that being said, uh, different from, for example, micro ring, for example, you need to use semiconductor foundry or uh, expensive equipment to have patterns created on the silicon substrate to make it a cheap scale micro resonator, right? However, if you want to just play the science, then just a uh, glass filament, hit the tip, Surface tension can help you to turn that into a microsphere, and you can play all kinds of science that discussed here. Okay, thank you. And the second question is the uh, optical resonance are the powerful nano device of the optics. So, and um, presence the optical computing is a very hot topic in the optical. So, is it possible to build some device for the optical computer in the future by using the resonance? I think so. Uh, if you uh, search for, for example, um, if you search for up and uh, 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 articles about computing uh, resonators, uh, it will tell you 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 are able to to do that. And one simple straightforward example I can give to you: when we do computing, right? The convention we do the computing, right? You generate mm -hmm. one and zero, yes. right? To to yes. do the computation, there's a conventional way. Maybe in the future, there's a completely different way to do the computing. But even with the conventional way, zero and one. By tuning the output of the resonators, you can turn on and off the resonance. Say, for example, resonance indicate one, and you just mm. tune resonance. Well, that's totally doable now with the thermal tuning, all kind of tuning approach. You can tune off, turn off the resonance, then become zero in, in output. And when you, you want a signal become one, you tune the system back into resonance, the signal appear again. So that okay. is just a basic way to understand how it can be used to control the signal generation and do the computing accordingly. Okay, okay, thank you. That's all. Yeah. Uh, excuse uh, me, uh, 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 I would also say something. So, yeah. uh, uh, Dr. Huang, you, you mentioned the optical computing, right? So, yes. Uh, oh, uh, in my opinion, uh, I want to say something, uh, for example, if you want to obtain an optical computer, first you need uh, a source. So 
So yeah. if you want to solve, we, we, we need uh, a resonator, a resonator for, for living or some coherent right, uh, like solves, right? And uh, yeah. you also need for, for encoding. So you need some modulator. So we can also use uh, optical resonator for, 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 for the modulation. And we can also use the uh, optical resonator for that kind of for, 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 for filter for, for achieve a filter or something. So, I mean, the optical resonator can uh, serve as many, many key, key okay. uh, elements for, 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 for achieve uh, uh, optical com uh, computing. So, yeah. Yeah, okay. she knows okay. thanks for you. Yeah, she does thanks for input. So in addition to compute direct computing itself, uh, in a in a whole system, the optical resonator mm. can play different roles, as she mentioned, the modulated filters, later source, and even photo detector actually. Because mm -hmm. it, it's so sensitive, right? It can imagine yes. it will be a very good single photon detectors because it's really sensitive. Yes, yes. That's very interesting. So Jian, do you go ahead if you have a question? Okay. Um uh, thanks for a very nice talk today. Uh, I have two questions. The first is concerning the exceptional points. Yeah. Um, as we know, there are many application scenarios of non-reciprocal transmission. I noticed that based on the exceptional points, it is usually realized uh, using tips, particles, or something. And besides, it works for specific wavelengths and even specific range of power based on some nonlinear process, nonlinear coupling process. Is there any possibility to realize more integrated broadband uh, wide power range in the future research on it? And uh, what part, which part should we pay, pay attention to it, pay attention to in the future research? Um, the second question is that, uh, we usually analyze the non-Hermitian system using through the Hamiltonian. I wonder whether the exceptional points behave the same in the quantum region and the classical region, uh, or there would exist some new physics in the when we tune into the quantum region. That's it. Yeah, <clears throat> that's a very good question. Actually, GN, that's... Your first question related to a new direction created in my lab. Um, uh -huh. I've been asked many times, they said, hey, this exception point fit is so interesting, but it's not realistic. Because in your research, you have been using, uh, you know, this narrative to tune that in reality is not useful. And that mm -hmm. is why uh, we started to explore three years ago, explore energy photonics. We do want it, we want to think uh, this is a broadband application or more integrable role, way to uh, generate this EP, EP state, right? Yes, yeah. you can. For example, <clears throat> what we can do is if you can have a materials that can modulate it by electric field, you know, for example, change the refract index. For example, mm -hmm. you can imagine the nano scatterer as something that locally modulate refract index, right? So for example, the particle, if you have, even if you have uniform structure, if you can have a way to locally modulate refract index of some part of the materials, it will behave like a scatterer. So you don't need to physically have a scatterer there. As long as you can locally change the optical property of something, of the structures, right? Then you can you can be, behave like a light scatterer. For example, we can deposit this is a low dimensional material like 2D, 2D materials. We'll oh. use materials like an ethanol bait that can be modulated through current. Then we can tune the system at a certain point, but more in an integrable way. Yeah, that's, uh, I totally agree with you. If you wanted to fully enjoy the fun and application of the physics, we do need to have a powerful practical platform. And that is why in the very last slide, I show the slide of integrated photonics. I do think that that is future that not only related to application, will give you a more powerful platform to explore science. And I didn't mention specify, for example, a Leon Fong's group in UPenn. The heat group can make a many resonators, you know, not just two resonators coupled to each other. They have tens of resonators coupled to each other. 
to uh to 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 explore more of non emission physics such as topological photonics they have many coupled ring resonators and you can demonstrate uh, uh there's a edge protected uh edge mode in such a structure to control mm -hmm. the flow of light in such a structure that is why i i mentioned that so that is answer to your first question and the second question um honestly even i don't have answer and because um that um in although the non emission physics right uh the concept started exploring the context quantum uh, quantum, quantum, quantum mechanics uh, but uh, most of the time we um in the re in reality we deal with a mechanical system right and uh and we have been dealing with you know the convention system mechanics electronics for us all the experiments we explored in the past uh, in quantum is classical regime right and in quantum system it's not that convenient you know control the loss and other things so in loss engineering i don't think it's straightforward way to to explore it in quantum regime but there are some nice papers showing um if you can operate in a quantum system at a certain point maybe you can extend that the coherent time coherent state of the system so i do think there are many studies on the way to explore the future of non-emission physics in quantum regime. And that's another thing, actually, I hope I can bring answer to you next year with more work exploring in the field. But I do think it is undergoing right now. Um, people are, are pushing this uh, non-emission physics to the quantum photonic system now. Thank you. Um, Dr. Cao, do you have any question? Yeah, uh, <laughs> I actually am also wondering uh, the story behind the research work. So especially for the uh, uh, optimal mechanics work, I mean the optimal mechanical solution, right? So, yeah. so uh, I'm curious uh, how to generate this idea or the, the, the accidental phenomenon object in life. Could you tell me some story about this work? Yeah, <laughs> you know, I, I like I, I like your question. You you truly think uh, behind behind the scene. Um, so that's another story I do want to share. It tells us how to do science. I think it's a nice story. <laughs> so many yeah. times we think doing science. I was asked, how do you find the idea? And then sometimes mm -hmm. I say, uh, I didn't find the idea. The idea find me. Uh, this is a good example mm -hmm. to show that. So um, that is why I encourage students, when you explore research in the lab, forget about the theory. When you're, when you're in the lab, fully focus on the observation because you never know what is new while right from experiments, right? So we did an intention to look for solid time, actually. We were running mm -hmm. experiments on optimal mechanics because uh, that is uh, five years ago. Optimal mechanics is still a very exciting topic in the resident, right? So we um, one straightforward way to generate the optimal mechanics is to increase light intensity because for to observe optimal mechanics, there is a certain threshold to, for the power. So we increase the power. Yeah. And we start to see, you know, increase power, you enhance light intensity. And then the radiation mm -hmm. pressure becomes larger and larger, right? And large enough mm -hmm. to vibrate the structure itself. And the structure itself, when it's vibrate, it will re in return affect the light field you start to see oscillation of the mode, right? Yeah. And we see that. And then at, and then for some structure, we found something interesting. Normally for mechanical oscillation, you can imagine, you know, this mode vibrate a different, you know, breathing mode, a swing, a different mode, right? Vibration mode. They uniformly affect the mode, constantly affect the mode. So you always see, you know, it can be sinus, nice sinusoidal mode or different kind of shape but it will be mm -hmm. constant change in time domain. However, we found that for some scenario, when you increase power to a certain, to a certain regime and also adjust detuning, detuning matters too. So for example, when we see a mode, right? We normally keep it on resonance. That's then observe things. But in this, in this case, in addition to adjust light intensity, but we also tune the, the pump, the, the wavelengths of the of the light inject into the resonance, then we found something really interesting. When you carefully adjust detuning at a certain range, later, later we found actually uh, the amount of power, power exchange between light mode and the phonon mode actually is also affected by the detuning between the pump wavelengths 
and the reson resonant wavelengths. And if you control the parameter nicely, then actually we found that those continuous oscillation gradually change and converge to a single pulse. And so that is how we found it. We didn't explore that, but we just play with different parameters. We encourage students, you know, when you're in the lab, try to play with different things and try to change the condition of the system. So then maybe we see something different. In this case, we saw pulse. And sometimes a single pulse, sometimes a multiple pulse. And then we started to explore the phenomena and then come up with this equation. And that time I wanted to, um, for this, I wanted to uh, mention Professor Jin Zhang. He is a professor. He was a professor mm -hmm. in Tsinghua University. He mm -hmm. is, um, for this, I want to emphasize the cross-discipline research is so important. He is an expert in control, in control theory. So that you can see he is very good at writing equation on the, understand a complicated system, right? So when we saw this, he was working with us on, in the lab. So he developed this theory and found this literature. And we found actually the prediction we found in the theory matched perfectly and explained very well about what we observed. Actually, soliton is a hot topic in, in, in math in math community. A lot of math equations and describe mm -hmm. it just physics, just the math mm -hmm. is a solution to equation that describe related to the soliton. And that's how we found it. That's how in this scenario, in this case, it's not a way uh, we were looking for soliton. We didn't know that. And even for the review process, so complicated. We this paper went through three rounds of, of review. Because for the even for our first version, we didn't have a full understanding of the system. So the review actually gave us feedback and give us help us to understand, to think deeper. So for our first version of manuscript submitted nature and the last version is very different. They could, even the equation change. So that's how we explore science. So when you first get a, the project, right, get some understanding. Even if the understanding is not perfect, it's on, it's it's fine. You know, keep explore that, and finally you will have the right answer. In this case, that is what happened. Not only us, uh, the science tell us, you know, come to us, and also the, even the reviewer play important role in the process, help us to understand the physics behind it. Mm -hmm. So you mean this phenomenon? Uh, or was, uh, was first observed accidentally or something? Yeah, accidentally, yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's very fun. That's why I said the beauty of uh, exploring science. It give, it's sense of curiosity is, you know, the sense of accomplishment to see something you didn't expect. Yeah, that's a great advice. story, a, a great story and a great advice. Mm -hmm. um, actually, yes. we really limited my time, but I really want to ask you the last question, um, but, but talking about story, I'm really curious to know a little bit about the, your experience of that uh, award-winning um, film, short, short film. Tell us a little bit about, you know, what the film is about and what's the key advice you really draw from that. Of course, you already gave a, you know, great yeah. advice about science for students, but yeah, just need to share because you're such a good storyteller. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, uh, so I want to tell you one word. For example, um, for students, you know, we do research, right? What is research? If you look at the word, re and search, right? You, re means do it again. I think re research is a process. Process, you search and search again. And sometimes we do research to explore answers to something, right? For example, like Chita mentioned, when you talk about quantum computing, you know you're going to make a laser. You know you are going to make a modulator. So you try your best to, to put together a functional device. But in other case, uh, for example, in my heart, the two-line research is the most exciting for me. One is a full fund of science. You have no idea what is you're exploring. It's driven by your curiosity. For that, don't have answer in your mind. It's totally okay. That is why I wanted to, I enjoy so much working with students. Fresh mind and don't be afraid of lack of background knowledge. It is okay. Maybe that's the strength you have. Without the background, you just explore whatever things you, you will be able to see in experiments. Try your best improve, improve your hands-on hands -on skills. And uh, without boundaries, sky is your limit. Explore the science, the forefront of science. And explore the unknown. Try to find answer to deepen our understanding of existing science, right? Another line of research I wanted to encourage students to work on is application-driven. Application-driven is something that there is some important challenges that have societal impact. 
something, for example, again, I want to use Cheetah's example, mentioned, you know, for quantum computing, right? You need a very mm -hmm. nice laser source, very nice modulator. Mm -hmm. For example, laser source, you want a tunable laser with broad tuning range, with narrow line width, as narrow as possible, because for some application, you really need a, not currently, there are a lot of tunable laser on market, right? But there are really any solution to give you the tunable laser with a very narrow line width. And for many applications, you want a very pure light, a very narrow line width. And how to solve that? There's a technical challenges. And for that one, mm -hmm. I want, you know, probably you need to read a lot of literature, have open mind, and uh, don't need to stick to one idea and be open minded. And I think that is key be open minded, full of curiosity, and don't take research as a burden for you. And for me, I think you should truly enjoy the lab work research as a playground to make good use of imagination so that you can explore and invent things that doesn't exist in the world. And you will become a very proud scientist, inventor, and di disruptor to make a change to the world. That's great. Thank you. With that, uh, I have to really uh, wrapping up tonight. Um, the, thank you so much, um, Professor Yang's really inspiring uh, talk and also all the, our panelists for a great question tonight. So um, let me just share my screen again. Um, so in representing ICANX Talks, uh, Professor Yang, this is the... Um, a uh, certificate is going to deliver to you and uh, your recognition of your great contribution to the ICANX talks. And um, and next week we'll have um, we'll have uh, uh, Professor Yuri Vanderburn from Andoven uh, University of Technology talking about organic neuromorphic electronics. And uh, and hope you can join us uh, for next week. Um, thank you very much, everyone.
不再是奇迹，不再是幻想，此刻正感觉全世界离我枯战了。不必太在意身旁惊奇的目光，可以点点头，可以放声歌唱。我创造奇迹，我拥有梦想，我希望看见所有骄傲的脸庞。再为曾经失败放弃或感伤，努力才是真的方向。I can, I can， 没有什么可以阻挡心中无限的